Welcome to Living Life. I'm so glad that you're able to join us today. Uh, today's passage will be dealing about sin and the effects of sin and how he actually corrupts our how it corrupts our hearts and our minds. And we'll get a glimpse of the dangers of sin as it makes us more and more insensitive towards sin. I think it is very easy um, to agree that the first time uh, we sin, there is a lot of hesitation, there's even a lot of fear. Um, you know, we feel horrible after we realize that we have sinned. But the very danger of sin is that the consecutive sins, the habitual sins, the sins that follow the first big one, they become easier and easier. Let us read today's passage together. And in reflection to today's passage, examine ourselves and see if there is a lot of hidden sin, a lot of sin that we have justified to ourselves, and a lot of sin that hardens our hearts. Hosea 10, 1-15 Israel was a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself. As his fruit increased, he built more altars. As his land prospered, he adorned his sacred stones. Their heart is deceitful, and now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones. Then they will say, We have no king because we did not revere the Lord. But even if we had a king, what could he do for us? They make many promises, take false oaths, and make agreements. Therefore, lawsuits spring up like poisonous weed in a plowed field. The people who live in Samaria fear for the calf idol of Beth Avon. Its people will mourn over it, and so will its idolatrous priests. Those who had rejoiced over its splendor, because it is taken from them into exile. It will be carried to Assyria as tribute for the great king. Ephraim will be disgraced. Israel will be ashamed of its foreign alliances. Samaria's king will be destroyed, swept away like a twig on the surface of the waters. The high places of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. Thorns and thistles will grow up and cover their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Since the days of Ghibli, you have sinned, Israel, and there you have remained. Will not war again overtake the evildoers in Ghibli? When I please, I will punish them. Nations will be gathered against them to put them in bonds for their double sin. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh, so I will put a yoke on her fair neck. I will drive Ephraim, Judah must plow, and Jacob must break up the ground. Sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. But you have planted wickedness, you have reaped evil, you have eaten the fruit of deception, because you have depended on your own strength and on your many warriors. The roar of battle will rise against your people so that all your fortresses will be devastated. As Shalma devastated Beth Arbel on the day of battle when mothers were dashed to the ground with their children. So it will happen to you, Bethel, because your wickedness is great. When that day dawns, the king of Israel will be completely destroyed. I'm sure that you noticed, but when we were reading through today's passage, uh, we came across a, a lot of imagery as well as a lot of wording. And, you know, we got this, uh, you know, this idea and picture of uh, agriculture, people farming. Uh, and this is something that we see in the Bible again and again, because uh, the people of Israel, uh, you know, were agricultural people. They, uh, you know, had land, uh, they plowed, uh, they were sowing seed. Uh, so a lot of imagery that God used to, you know, make things relatable to them, uh, you know, used everyday 
uh, concepts. And we see this um, when the prophet Hosea um, speaks out against the sinfulness of his peers. And he talks about how sin has affected not just the individual, but the community. And sin has affected uh, the people of Israel. In everyday behavior and interaction with one another, we see how sin has now an effect on everyone. Sin has become of everyday life. Now, when we look into verse 4, I'm just going to read it real quick for us. We see that how sin is running rampant and how it really continues to grow. Uh, the uh, verses here, the words here in this verse say, they make many promises, you know, referring to the people of Israel, take false oath and make agreements. Therefore, lawsuits spring up like poisonous weeds in a plowed field. And I don't know if you've ever grown things. Um, during COVID, uh, because of our two young boys, uh, we did a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, growing plants. You know, start with like peppers and the Korean perilla leaves uh, called genyip. And one of the things that you need to watch out for is weeds. Because whatever you try to do, these weeds come back. And then you have one, then you have two. And if you don't um, pay close attention, these weeds take over and actually killing uh, the actual plants that you wanted to grow there. And this is what sin does. It is this uh, impossible thing to manage. Without God's mercy and grace, without God's uh, presence in us, uh, these sins can take over. This is why James uh, warns us about sin and the temptation, that we need to always be on guard. In chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Then after desire has conceived. So it starts with temptation. It starts with this desire that we have. He says it gives birth to sin. So you have the desires, our human sinful desires. And then when we leave them unchecked, it becomes sin. And when it, it is full grown, it uh, gives birth to death. And I think what James is referring to is previously in the Bible it says, you know, uh, for the wages of sin is death. Just because God is not punish punishing us right away doesn't mean that there is a consequence to sin. God abhors sin. God is not able to tolerate sin. We should not be mistaken to think that God's patience with us is His ignorance towards our sin. God is aware of our sins even the ones that we try to justify to God as well as to ourselves. You know, it's not really sin because everyone is doing it. It's not really sin because, you know, at the end, I had good intentions with this. My sin is okay because I'm not sinning as bad as some of the other people here. No, uh, God abhors sin and there is an inherent danger to sin. But what are we supposed to do when sin takes over? When sin has hardened our minds, when sin has made us callous, and our hearts are not even able to be penetrated by God's love and His mercy, and we wonder, why am I not hearing His voice? It is because we have become so stubborn, we have become so used to ignoring God's voice and listening to this world, that we think He has become silent. But God is still speaking to us. God is speaking to us. And in verse 11 to 12, we see what we are called to do. Ephraim is a trained heifer uh, that loves to thresh, so I will put a yoke on her fair neck. I will drive Ephraim. Judah must plow and Jacob must break up the ground. And I think this verse really caught my attention. Because sometimes our hearts are hardened. Our minds are hardened. And sometimes we even feel dead. We feel so far away from God and we feel like there's nothing that can happen, nothing that can bring us back to Him. In verse 12 it says, Sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until He comes and showers His righteousness on you. God wants to bring you back to life. God wants to make the, the, the soil, the field inside of us, our minds and our hearts. He wants to make them fruitful. He wants us to bear incredible, beautiful uh, fruit uh, that is not for our benefit, but grows for the glory of God. 
When we think about Jesus and how he used a very similar metaphor in Matthew chapter 12, when he talks about the parable of the sower, we see the desire of the Father who uh, sprinkles his seeds into all of our hearts. But it is the condition of the heart that, de that determines how much fruit we will bear. And it is my prayer for you as well as for me today that we would have fertile soil, prepared soil, soil that is ready uh, to be sowed upon by God. No matter what the condition of your current heart is, no matter how uh, stubborn up until this moment you were, and maybe you feel my heart and my, my soul and my mind it feels dead. It feels completely empty. It feels like this cold, a rock that no one can bring back to life. God is able. In God and through Christ, hope is always an option. Today, we can turn away from sinfulness as we turn to God in repentance. Because repentance is not something that is going to fill us with fear and is going to fill us with shame. But in repentance, we rejoice because we know that we're not just saying sorry, but we are turning with our lives back to the Father who embraces us, who welcomes us back into His arms, and who lovingly, graciously, filled with mercy, starts to sow into our lives again and brings even us that feel we are completely lost and dead back to life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and right now uh, we want to confess our iniquities and we want to confess our shortcomings and we confess our sinfulness. And God, we see that uh, sin is so scary. It is so powerful. It separates us from you. And it makes us completely numb. And it makes us dead to ourselves. But you uh, can bring us back to life. You can make our hearts beat again. You can bring our minds back into this place of worship. And this is where we want to be, in your presence. We want to be able to gaze at your beauty we want to feel your gentle touch and we want to hear your powerful whisper as you breathe back life into us. So God, right now we surrender. We confess all of our shortcomings and our sins and we repent. And we want to uh, align ourselves back again with you and we want to live differently. Would you help us? Would you empower us? Would you give us the strength to hold on as you're always holding on to us? God, we thank you, we love you. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said, Amen.